Well, thank you, Meredith, um, and thank you all for coming here on a rainy day, and thank you uh, to Radcliffe. Um, this has been an incredible opportunity uh, to be a fellow here so far, and I can't believe I still have so many months left. Um, it's amazing, and I'm really looking forward to the chance to share my current work in progress uh, with you all tonight, and then hearing your uh, questions and comments afterward. Um, so I want to talk um, before delving into the substance of what brings uh, uh, me and you all here presumably today um, to sort of step back um, as is often the case when talking about issues of sexual violence to sort of have a meta level uh, discussion, um, which is the material here is horrific, right? There's no doubt that sexual violence is one of the worst things that uh, human beings can do to each other. Um, but it also um, is a topic that is often the way we speak about it is uh, dysfunctional. And I don't shy away from uh, talking about things in sometimes explicit or graphic terms, uh, because as you'll see, one of the themes of my scholarship, both in the past and in this book, is that it's our failure to have a healthy dialogue about sex and consent and sexual violence that creates a lot of the cultural and legal dysfunction that we now see. Um, I also make linguistic choices throughout my talk that you might disagree with and you might think are, are poor choices on my part. Um, and for that, I apologize, but I, I do have reasons for them. So for example, one common um, uh, rhetorical choice made by people who talk about sexual violence is do you refer to people who've been attacked as victims or as survivors or victim survivors? I use uh, the word victim, um, not because I don't have tremendous respect for the people who prefer uh, survivor, and there is a split among many uh, different communities and activist groups, but because, again, one of the themes of my work uh, dictates this choice, which is that I s struggle with uh, the way the United States has differentiated people who've been raped from, say, those who've been assaulted, those who've been battered, who's had their homes burglared, what, whatever the crime. And we call all those people victims. And so one of the reasons I choose to use the word victim is to reconnect uh, people who've been raped with uh, um, other uh, people who experience violent or horrific crime. But I also um, sometimes use things that we, we don't associate uh, it with uh, sexual violence. So there will be some humor in this presentation. Um, there will be some colloquialisms. Uh, there will be profanity, which maybe that does go with the territory. Um, because I think one of the other dangers we have in talking about sexual violence is, and this is particularly true of academics, and I think legal academics, is that we abstract away from the way people really talk about sex and sexual violence. We give very dry, distilled, legalistic, or academic language to describe things that aren't is, you know, uh, that abstract and in fact are very real and specific. Um, and so uh, I, I'm just giving you that little, little explanation up front in case as we're going along, uh, you're like, what is he doing up there? Well, uh, now you know what I'm doing, and then feel free afterwards to say, why did you do that? I'm, I'm happy to hear that, uh, but I at least wanted to give you uh, that warning. I have two goals for today. Uh, one is to talk about some of the things that most of you probably have not talked about before, or at least have uh, not talked about maybe as much as I think you should, which is uh, sexual violence issues get talked about in a very particular way with a very particular rhetoric um, that often um, belies more breadth than depth. And I think that's something I wanna, wanna push away from. But I also, my, my biggest goal and my biggest hope is that afterwards, uh, you might feel you know, encouraged and empowered to talk about these things in your own life more, uh, to be willing to say, hey, maybe, maybe this idea is something we should think about, or maybe you're not treating that person in a way that seems really uh, focused on their consent and their autonomy. So um, hopefully, hopefully we can get there. But um, you know, the, the topics I'm gonna talk about are not alien, right? They're everywhere you look if you just follow the media, right? I can always, anytime I give a talk, I can just say, look at the news for the last couple of weeks and see what crazy, ridiculous things 
have Americans done lately regarding sex and sexual violence? Some of you may have seen T.I. who escorts his daughter to uh, her annual gynecological appointments to make sure her hymen is intact. Uh, that shows a very particular view about uh, virginity, innocence, and uh, child sexuality. Um, we had Katie Hill. I, mean, that, that, I know our political news cycle goes so quick that it seems like it was so long ago already. Um, she has hired a, f a very good lawyer, Carrie Goldberg, who I want to give a brief mention to her, uh, Daniel Citron, and Marianne Franks, who've led the a nationwide movement to criminalize revenge porn. Um, that story just recently. There are some uh, local news stories that I don't even know what to say, right? These are often the things that go viral, and you're just like, what? You know, um, typically they happen in Florida. This one was somewhere else, but you know, um, Florida man not responsible for the chicken coup raid while nude. Um, then you get stories that, you know, show uh, defects in our society. Sex education is so bad, these teens are doing it on TikTok. If you don't know what TikTok is, um, that means you're not the audience for TikTok. Um, but yeah, there you go. Uh, you got, got a banana with a condom. That's good. Um, okay. And then just a couple weeks ago, North Carolina decided to catch up with the rest of the country. Um, and it's now true in North Carolina, but it wasn't until then, uh, that you can now withdraw consent during sex. Uh, previously, the law in New York, uh, North Carolina, even though it's been known for several years to be the case, once you gave consent, you could not withdraw it. I mean, these are very basic defects in the law that take a while to cure. And so this is happening all the time you see it, but, but we seem to have some cultural attitudes that aren't the healthiest. So the, the paradox that I define in my, my project is divided into two categories. <clears throat> the first is denial, right? Denial. Um, denial is the basic idea that we have a psychological defense mechanism uh, to prevent us from confronting difficult truths. And you know, it was first sort of identified by Sigmund Freud, but it was actually more developed uh, by his daughter, Anna. And it's you know, something that's been uh, written about extensively at an individual level. Surprisingly, there's not a lot of academic wor work at the social uh, and cultural level. Um, but in the case of sexual violence, perhaps as, as Meredith mentioned, the clearest um, uh, indicator of our cultural denial about at least one form of sexual violence is untested rape kits. And that's what's uh, in this picture. There's hundreds of thousands of them across the country uh, that have uh, many cases, they're decades old. Uh, they've sat on shelves, uh, many in conditions that the evidence was deteriorating. It wasn't going to uh, be testable after a few years anyway uh, because the conditions weren't uh, meant for biological material. Um, some places there's, you know, I, it was just the other day, a couple days ago, Minneapolis discovered uh, that, oh yeah, we forgot we had another like 1,500 of these lying around. Um, but I also want to clear up one of the misconceptions about these rape kits, and it shows sort of a second level of denial, right? Some of you may have heard of these untested kits as the rape kit backlog, right? You know, and that's the phrase that's often used. But backlog has a particular meaning, right? It's as though all these kits are in a line and we just haven't gotten to some, right? That they're just waiting to be tested, but there's this lack of resources. That's not true. And, and it's just not true at all. Um, and I do have to credit you know, some other people in this area, in particular a couple activists. Um, Megan uh, Ebus and Heather Marlowe have really pushed this point and published it. Uh, they were both attacked, uh, and uh, Megan was only 16 at the time when she was had her home broken into and uh, was held at knife point. And police disbelieved her and said, no, you, you shouldn't be asking for attention. They accused her of making it up. And her kit was never tested, right? Not until nine years later when uh, her attacker was arrested for a separate crime, and she identified him and said, hey, that was the guy who attacked me that you didn't believe me about. And sure enough, it matched his DNA. That these kits were never going to be tested, right? These kits were um, based on a police decision. It might have been a triage type resource decision. But the simple fact is, I'll document here in a bit, is police did not take these claims seriously. And so hundreds of thousands of kids just sat there. And so yes, the, um, the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women's Acts has given money for these to be tested. And you know what? Most jurisdictions still haven't tested them, right? They still are not showing a strong inclination. And yet in jurisdictions where they are being tested, such as Cleveland, Cleveland's found one out of every three of these new tested kits that weren't previously tested matches somebody in the system, meaning that they could have led to the crimes being solved earlier and that vic further victimizations could have been prevented. And so 
maybe don't use the word backlog. Just a, just a suggestion uh, in talking about this in the future. OK, you might have also seen uh, on Netflix, uh, movie Unbelievable came out just a couple months ago. Um, it itself is, I don't want to say it's unbelievable, but it is unbelievable. I mean, the, the fact that this movie was even made is kind of crazy, um, because generally these stories about uh, particularly women not being believed, but we'll talk about other gender dynamics later, uh, they just get ignored. They're not something that the media focuses on. But if you haven't watched it, um, this tells the story of a woman who was 18 at the time. Uh, she was attacked in Washington state, and uh, she said a stranger broke into her home. She was bound, she was brutally attacked, and then the attacker uh, forced her uh, to remove all forensic evidence. Police disbelieved her. Prosecutors prosecuted her for filing a false report. She pled guilty um, because she did not have the money and the time and the resources to fight it. She had to pay a fine and agree to counseling for a year. Uh, afterward, uh, in Colorado, uh, her attacker, um, O'Leary, <coughs> excuse me, Mark O'Leary, was captured. Uh, he not only had her identification card, but actually had her pictures being terrorized and abused. Um, and the case, you know, more or less in this very horrible world of sexual violence has what the movie kind of portrays as a happy ending, right? Okay, the police messed up at first, but justice was done in the end. These stories are far more common than you think. I, this was my excerpt of it when I wrote an article about it. Um, you know, the, the story when it was originally covered was just in a couple local Washington papers, and then the Marshall Project picked it up and with ProPublica, and then the producers of the movie saw it, and suddenly we had a movie. But that's itself a, a very unusual course uh, for these stories to be told. For the most part, as my more recent scholarship has, has included, these stories happen a lot, and you don't hear about them. Um, and they're often with even more egregious fact patterns, but I'll, I'll get to those in a bit. First, I want to um, give you a little more background and, and where some of my research in this area is focused. So if you haven't seen The Wire, you should, because, well, it's The Wire, and it's the best TV show ever made. Uh, but one of the key aspects of The Wire, uh, and particularly in the second season, is how police departments, uh, especially in big cities with uh, very uh, statistically driven departments, uh, have engaged in um, various tactics to make their numbers look better. And police are under tremendous pressure to show gains in decreasing violent crime because the public constantly believes it's increasing, even when it's not. And, uh, you know, the character Cedric Daniels, he was just saying, I, I won't play that game, right? Well, this, you know, is connected to the real world in a very real way. David Simon, the chief creator of The Wire, was a longtime reporter for the Baltimore Sun, and he observed this going on in the Baltimore Police Department. And so not surprisingly, the Baltimore Police Department has more recently been exposed by a great crime reporter, a rarity in this modern media age, Justin Fenton, discovered that they've been ignoring most rape complaints for a long time. They don't investigate them. They don't take them seriously. And we'll talk about how we know that and what um, uh, is, is unique and not unique about Baltimore. So, Stories like you know this you know the what what was exhibited in the wire and was it has um, been picked up upon by local media in several cities. So I mentioned Baltimore, New Orleans, Philadelphia, St. Louis, Washington D.C. have all had media or other interest groups uncover widespread police corruption toward not investigating rape claims. Um, and it's it's not even subtle, right? St. Louis actually had a whole separate process uh, for uh, taking rape complaints and then filing what they, was a desk memo. So it was a memo that didn't get centralized and didn't count in official rape statistics for any complaint that came in. And then they actually went to uh, people who made rape complaints and tried to have them sign a waiver saying, my complaint was false, in order for them to not be prosecuted for filing a false complaint. Uh, New Orleans had a category called Signal 21, which was normally used for non-criminal matters. And you might wonder what are non-criminal matters to the police? Mostly noise complaints, right? People say, my neighbor's too loud, whatever. Uh, they put 60% of their rape claims in the Signal 21 non-criminal case. I mean, these are egregious, rampant, widespread uh, failure to investigate uh, in these cities. So let me look at a, a city that's more typical, Seattle. You'll notice I have a murder rate and a rate of rape uh, as uh, collected by the FBI as part of the Uniform Crime Reports. 
crime rates are actually really highly correlated. Um, there's eight tracked crimes, and generally cities, they all go up and down together. They just look like nice little lines all lined up. Um, we, variances are unusual. Um, and it's because policing overall just is, you know, you might have a task force focused on certain types of drug violence, but for the most part, the safety of a city across these eight crimes is uh, highly correlated. You might wonder why the y-axis is so big. Well, you'll see in a second. Um, so we'll go to Baltimore. Well, Baltimore looks a little different, um, right? Baltimore's uh, rate of murder, eh, pretty high there, right? 800% of the national average, because that's how I've normalized it. Uh, their rate of rape is, goes down quite a bit. It hangs around the national average and goes up. Well, this is uh, uh, during the time that we know they were classifying a large segment of their rape complaints as unfounded. Unfounded is a way of designating a complaint that doesn't count in your official rape statistics. It's a way of gaming the numbers. But this was being done not as required by the FBI, invest, uh, FBI rule after a full investigation. It was just being done the moment the complaints were brought in. There would be a triage decision made by an officer that says, we don't believe you, and that's it. The complaint wouldn't move any further. And this has happened and been discovered several times in Baltimore's recent history. And there's always a, we're going to clean house. We're going to do things better next time. And then nothing changes, right? There's an enormous gap here. Well, okay, that's interesting. Let's look at another city, which is, you know, I can't say with 100% certainty they have the worst policing of sexual violence, but I'm, I'm going to go with 99.9. .9. New Orleans is ridiculously awful. Um, and uh, it's not, again, even subtle. I already mentioned um, how they were classifying these as non-criminal matters. Uh, but uh, they've gone much further. So again, we see a cycle here. So in 2012, they're caught by the local media. The Times-Picayune says, oh my God, these are all these uh, victims are being ignored. Complaints aren't being dealt with. We bring in reforms. There's actually a consent decree with the federal government, which is one of the few ways um, that the federal government can intervene in these cases to try and affect change. Importantly, it's something the Trump administration has now stopped. So even that little mechanism that exists of consent decrees to um, make local policing better, that's gone. Uh, and they brought in all new people. And then, you know, there was a state inspector general report, which also documented all this. So even their state report said, yeah, this is pretty awful. Um, but then it happened again. Um, and in fact, um, over a three-year window, this time, um, the advocate, along with the New York Times, exposed uh, a lot of other failings here. And they even have a specialized SVU unit, right? So you know what SVU is, right? Law and Order SVU, uh, Special Victims Unit. Uh, they have their own sex crime designated unit. And the people who were assigned to these cases did not take them seriously. And some of them, the cases that were ignored, um, I mean, it's, it's really, it, it's so beyond the pale um, that I, I, it sh shocks the conscience to be able to, to articulate that this happened. So one case the New York Times found, a two-year-old came into the emergency room testing positive for an STD. Right, so you have a two-year-old with STD. No investigation performed, case closed. I mean, it's just, how could any person with any semblance of a moral conscience do this? Well, there were, you know, cultural biases, but there were also incentives, right, to make these cases go away. These are resource-intensive cases that rarely lead to prosecutions, and people are rewarded if they clear cases. And clearance can occur through a lot of ways. It can through, clear through an arrest, right? That's the way you'd hope it would happen. But it can also occur what's called an exceptional clearance. The most common form of exceptional clearance, non-cooperation by the victim. Well, if you want to get non-cooperation of a victim, you can, right? You can tell them their case is going nowhere, right? This is, this is only going to cause bad things for you and your family. And so not surprisingly, investigations of many police departments um, most prominently in LA, after the Rampart scandal, they had to open up and, and be a little more transparent. They discovered 21% of rape cases were being triaged and disposed of through exceptional clearance. The victims were said to be not cooperating. Um, and so New Orleans has had you know, this problem over and over and over. Uh, very few cases ever get investigated at all. Prosecutions and convictions are even rare. OK, so we have Baltimore. We have New Orleans, St. Louis, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. What I did, and I'm not going to get into the methods, but I'm happy to answer questions about this, is say, well, okay, if these are our, our, our known 
um, liars. These are our police departments that are giving fictitious, fake crime stats. What, are there other departments that have the same statistical profile? Um, well, I reconstructed, oh, whoops, I forgot to actually show you. Yeah, New Orleans has the, the same basic problem as Baltimore, right? Ridiculously high rate of murder, very low rate of rape. Um, and so I would decide, let's just try and reconstruct the data. Let's see what happens. Well, I identified 46 other jurisdictions that also seem to have this same big gap between rape and the other seven track crimes. I then used their murder rate to sort of guide that. And what you see here is something that you might not appreciate how remarkable this, this slide is uh, without knowing one other tidbit of information. Since the early 90s, we are in the midst of what's called the great American crime decline, which means every year, one minor hiccup, but still the overall trend is incredible. We've had uh, record decreases in violent crime. Uh, we are at the lowest level of violent crime in modern history. And so that yellow line, which is the rate under the Uniform Crime Report of rape decreasing, it doesn't decrease quite as fast as some of the other violent crimes, but it's still decreasing. Well, it turns out when you reconstruct the data with either more conservative or less conservative assumptions, it doesn't look like sexual violence. Rape has gone down at all. You'll also notice here the title of this slide. Why am I only focused on forcible rape of women? And actually, it's even narrower than that, forcible rape of women with vaginal penetration, because that's the only thing the FBI tracked until 2012. So this is the only data that exists. Uh, and we now have data, and one of the things I'm doing here is looking at the years where jurisdictions have voluntarily included numbers on uh, other cases as well. But this is notable because these are the cases that conventional wisdom says should be handled properly under the current system, right? Forcible, we associate with stranger cases, right? They're, these are not populations that we assume to be mostly same-sex uh, patterns or transgender patterns, which police ignore even more. These are the core cases that most people say, yeah, I bet the police handled those okay. They don't. And the record is really clear, statistically, and also based on these cities that we've seen. Um, the media does a better job than academics and sometimes relaying this. So I was happy that uh, you know, the nation, when covering my research, said, yeah, one million rapes is basically what happened here. Between 1995 and 2012, one million cases were just not investigated. I mean, that's not a small number. And these are just forcible rapes of women with vaginal penetration. You know, this is a, a remarkable number. And this is, does not count cases that were never reported to the police at all, right? The UCR's only reported instance. This is a remarkable number. Also, one of the, the greatest um, moments I've had of joy as an academic, which when you're studying sexual violence, well, there's not a lot, um, was somebody took my paper and did something I didn't think could be done with it, which is they applied it to a different data set, which is more localized, and um, found, not surprisingly, that the distribution of under investigation is not equal, meaning that neighborhoods that are minority majority in St. Louis complaints are even less likely to be investigated. So if you are in a African-American part of town, your case was almost never going to be taken seriously. Um, and so, you know, this is something that's, that's, you know, horrifying. I mean, horrifying, the level here. But, you know, some people respond more to numbers and data. Some people, um, uh, uh, you know, want to know a little bit more of the cultural aspects. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the intersectionality here, right? Uh, first of all, I'm leaving out a lot of same-sex rape dynamics um, because we have very little information about them. We know uh, that male-to-male uh, -male rape is a long-standing phenomenon that police have ignored, but the degree to which they have, and it has it varied regionally, we're only starting to get it real information about. Uh, one of my uh, friends and, and co-editor now, Bennett Capers, has done an incredible job of studying this. Um, uh, also, uh, Sarah Deer has articulated how Indian country, uh, American Indian women's on reservations are particularly victimized and attacked at levels that uh, really dwarf uh, what goes on outside of reservations. Uh, transgendered populations are uh, not studied well at all in the United States, but it's a worldwide phenomenon that people um, who identify as transgendered are more likely to be victimized. Um, but there's also race. I have only touched on in that last piece the fact that neighborhoods that are minority majority uh, have their complaints ignored more. But there's actually a, a one instance where some of the dynamics I've talked about flip 
which is when a white woman accuses a black man of rape. Uh, this is, if you don't know this, this is the Scottsboro Boys. Uh, boys because several of them were minors. Um, it was a famous incident in the early 20th century where um, several uh, men were, and boys were convicted uh, for rape that we know they didn't commit um, because uh, two white women who were on these trains were given a choice. They were told by the local authorities, either you say you were raped or we're going to tell everyone that you miscegenated, right? You had relations with African Americans and no one will ever touch you again. And so they made a choice. They later recanted. As far as I know, this case is the only incident in history where a, a prisoner who escaped, this was in Alabama, uh, and fled to Michigan, and Michigan refused to extradite him back because Michigan said, we know he's innocent, we're not giving him to you. Um, but the injustice was done. This has happened a lot uh, in, in early 20th century America. Um, in fact, one of the justifications for slavery was often that if you let uh, black male slaves free, they will rape white women. I mean, it was used over and over and over again. Uh, lynchings, both judicial and extrajudicial, uh, were associated strongly with these cases. But there's also another part of the dynamic, which is the reemergence of the myth of the Jezebel, which is a seductress, a woman who, you know, men are taken off the good and righteous path. And this was prominently uh, targeted at uh, black women in uh, 20th century America and continues to this day. Uh, something Kimberly Crenshaw um, talked about a bit and sort of the rules that we give and assumptions about uh, victimization in um, um, sexual violence cases. And so each of these provides more you know, um, cultural baggage to any individual case and confuse the picture more. But let me uh, briefly, although probably not briefly, but I'm trying briefly, uh, two more stories. Um, how many of you have heard of Anthony Soule before? Okay. Anthony Soule uh, is called the Cleveland Strangler. Four different women reported being raped and attacked by him. Um, the first one was ignored because she wouldn't come down to the station. Cleveland police came up with an ad hoc policy that we won't take rape complaints by phone, and they refused to send a car to pick her up, even though she said, I just escaped from this guy's house, and there was a decapitated head in a bucket. They ignored it. Second person, they did not take her claim seriously because she had an outstanding minor misdemeanor warrant. So even though they went to the house with her and him, she had a bloody wound on her head. There was blood on the stairs. He said she started it, warrant on her, didn't go any further. He was actually on the sex offender registry and had a prior conviction for rape. They didn't even look that up. The third person, who is the person that ultimately gets police to go further, um, reports the complaint. She doesn't have any outstanding warrants. They decide she's credible enough, but they don't rush. So in the intervening time before the month passes uh, when he, um, they eventually do raid his home, um, another person is attacked and falls out of the third story window of the home fractures her skull. Um, of course, not reflecting well on many Americans, people had cell phones taking videos of it, um, as seen on commercial security video from across the street. He was allowed to ride along with her to the hospital because he said, oh, my wife and I were having rough sex and she fell out the window. She, of course, did not tell the police who were at the, the hospital what he had done because he was right there um, and she was terrified and had a fractured skull. Eventually, they do go and raid the house. They find 11 decomposing bodies in the walls and in there. How could this be ignored? At least seven, if not more of those people were killed after the first report, right? This pattern happens way more and yet you don't hear as much about it. Daniel Hicks Best, I'm sorry, Hicks Best. Uh, she was 11 years old when she was gang raped in DC. Uh, she was found by the police wandering the streets. Her family reported her missing. They took her to the station. They interrogated her for hours in the same clothes she was wearing while she was attacked. They told her she was lying. They told her she was making stuff up. They prosecuted her filing a false complaint, an 11 year old. She got a, a lawyer appointed to her who said, there's nothing you can really do, just plead guilty. She was made a ward of the state and removed from her family. Police lieutenants exchanged email on the case. Now she's 11 years old. The people who accused her of attacking her were all in their upper teens and early 20s. All sex was, and I don't know if this is intentional or not, consexual. Parents are unable to accept the fact of this child's promiscuous behavior caused this situation. Right. These cases, we don't hear as much. These are both in the last uh, uh, 15 years. Okay. 
What's the other side? I've talked a lot about denial. Well, what's panic? Well, on the one hand, we ignore sexual violence complaints, but then we freak out about sex offenders. Stanley Cohen, the famous criminologist, first identified this idea of moral panic, where we would get an exaggerated sense of something horribly wrong in our society, and we overreact. And we've certainly done this with sex offenders, right? It's, it's all over. Uh, Halloween brought the Halloween lockdowns, which is crazy. There's never been a case of a sexual abuse from trick-or-treating, yet every year, every sex offender gets locked down uh, as though it will help. And we see it, you know, to catch a predator, all sorts of warning signs. It's just, it's, it's built into our modern culture, and it's been going on since the early 90s. Well, who are these sex offenders? Well, I'm sure many of you in your head are right now thinking, rapist, child molester. Yeah, but it's actually far more than that, and they are not the, the majority of our offenders. Um, of course, there's a lot of weird sex crimes you see in the media, right? So you got vacuum cleaner, picnic table, ATM. Yes, men will have sex with almost any inanimate object, I think, is, is the lesson here. Um, public urination is actually a sex offense in several states because it's treated as public indecency. Um, there are also cases where, um, you know, where somebody is only tangentially involved. In this case, Janet Allison was incredibly tragic. Her daughter got pregnant from a, a boy who was older. She said, you're gonna live in my house, we're gonna take care of this kid. She was prosecuted as accessory to statutory rape. Uh, and uh, the sex uh, residency restrictions in the state of Georgia, her family has had to relocate many times, often multiple times in the same year, relocating her kids in their school district over and over and over. Is she a danger in the same way? I wouldn't think so. Um, there are uh, sexting. Sexting is something that teenagers do far more than they should, but it's prosecuted as distribution of child pornography because it includes nude images of minors. If you look at the registry themselves and not just media articles, you see a lot of weird things. Burglary in the second degree, distribution of obscene videos. I mean, you made some movies with your spouse. I don't know, there you go. Um, amazingly, sodomy. People who are convicted for consensual sodomy before the laws were struck down under Lawrence v. Texas have had an incredible trouble getting off the registries. And in fact, many states have said they can't. Um, and so even people who are, um, were considered sex offenders under a regime that's now considered unconstitutional uh, are still there. And so this, this is moral panic, right? There may be a core concern, but it's exaggerated beyond all reason and sense. And so we've come up with all these new restrictions, right? Registration, community notification, residency restrictions, uh, GPS monitoring, civil commitment. Uh, Florida has several jurisdictions that ban sex offenders from hurricane shelters, right? I mean, that's insane. There's a hurricane, so you're a sex offender, so just stay out there. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. Um, homelessness is incredibly high. Uh, embarrassingly for the Miami newspapers, the New York Times exposed the story of how sex offenders were released from prison in the state of Florida and just taken to a bridge in Miami under the highway, and that's where they were located for several years. Um, that was their address because there's these consequences provide them almost no place to live and no uh, uh, opportunity for employment. So how are both these things true? We don't take rape cases seriously. We also don't take child molestation cases seriously, but I don't have time to talk about that. We panic on the other end and say, but if you did do it, well, then, you know, and that seems to be, and there's a tension there. Um, you know, so we can start with very basic um, cognitive dissonance theory here, right? Which is to say, we like comforting lies and we don't like hard truths, right? So we kind of want both these things to be true. We want to think sexual violence is not a big problem, but when it is, we will make sure you suffer the full run of the law. But that's, that's not enough. I think we need to look a little deeper at, at some of our, our cultural dynamics that are not the healthiest. And so, um, you know, I'm going to turn to a, an American icon of sorts, uh, one that I think you all know, uh, but if not, well, that's probably better for you, um, which is uh, everyone's favorite cartoon skunk, Pepe Le Pew. So watch Pepe and watch the cat in this uh, uh, little video here. Pepe Le Pew was created in 1945 by Warner Brothers. Um, the cat is not Come even a name on, Penelope, don't be a naughty for almost the first 30 years of the cartoon's existence. Every episode pretty much revolves around the cat getting a paint white stripe down her back through all sorts of convoluted means. 
And then she gets attacked over and over by Pepe, who is the protagonist of our story. And it's not even subtle. I mean, her eyes have turned yellow. He's going to keep, you know, penning her down, grabbing her. She's resisting over and over and over. Many, every year I show this to my students, and, and many of them are like, I didn't remember it that way, right? You know, I know I watched this as a kid, but seeing it now, it's different, right? Not only, why would you make this? But then why would you show it to kids? Um, this is a very strange thing, but it's, it's very built into our culture. Now, uh, you'll notice uh, here she actually uses a bat and hits him over the head. There's one episode where she commits suicide. It's sort of a joke. She jumps off a cliff, and uh, Pepe takes that as a sign of her love. Yeah. Um, now, uh, Warner Brothers did get a lot of, of, of people complaining about Pepe, um, in the 50s, but it was because they thought it was a French stereotype. Um, that was what really got to them. The whole idea that he was a rapist, oh, well, that, was, that wasn't as big a deal. But Pepe embodies a pursuit model of romance that was very common in this period of cultural ignorance. Is like, all right, in other words, men's job is to pursue, not take no for an answer. Um, and so Pepe is going to provide a little backdrop here as I tell you a little story about modern American history in this regard. So we have to, the buttons here were a little weird. Uh, Okay, you see it elsewhere, right? You're gonna hear this song a lot. <laughs> Many of you probably have looked at the lyrics before and said, hey, that's kind of strange, right? It might be the first pop culture reference to a roofie. Uh, baby, it's cold outside, it's like, don't go, stay. And then there's this weird refrain. Say, what's in this drink? Uh, yeah, and what's that's doing there is a little unclear. Uh, Delilah by Tom Jones, well, it's just flat horrific. But you know, people are sometimes say, well, but it's about a horrible thing, right? A man who kills a woman when he's jealous. It varies, though, in the context. Strangely, in Wales, uh, t where Tom Jones is from, it's, it's sung to cheer on their rugby team. Um, so uh, how that fits, I'm not quite sure. Uh, Brown Sugar by Rolling Stones seems to be Mick Jagger's love of black women, which he starts by telling the story of a slave ship captain and his relations. It's, it's an oddity. Uh, Greece, we start to get a little more subtle, right, as we get closer and closer to the rape law reform period. You know, there's still this weird lyric. Did she put up a fight? I mean, is that really how we view romance? Well, the pursuit model does. But we have a lot of other cultural artifacts that point towards this idea. Um, this is from the website TV Tropes. They collect tropes, and they, this one they call Dude, She's Like in a Coma. Uh, well, yeah, that's kind of an odd name, but it's kind of right on the nose, right? Um, we have a lot of fairy tales, and Disney has you know, revived these, where a kiss of a sleeping woman creates true love. And uh, in the case of Snow White, they, they've never met. I mean, this is creepy, right? This is, some, and this is weird behavior. Uh, they actually have scores of incidents where this plot device is used um, in cartoons and fairy tales. These are, these are weird, and this is a lot of our history. Well, as I mentioned, the rape law reform movement starts to raise awareness in the 70s and 80s. And so Warner, Warner Brothers, because Pepe Le Pew is going to be the, the connecting thread for all this history, uh, they finally realized, OK, maybe having a skunk that sexually assaults a cat is not a good thing. But rather than abandoning the series, they say, no, we'll just have the cat fall in love with Pepe. And so they finally give the cat a name, Penelope, and they love each other. And we just won't talk about all that other history, right? They'll, we'll just ignore that, even though we'll show the old cartoons. This is a period of imperfect awareness, right? So we start seeing movies like The Accused, which in one sense was incredibly powerful in raising awareness about rape and how women are ignored. On the other hand, they took a real case, the Big Dan Daver Big Dan's Tavern case, and completely changed all the facts and the outcome to make it have a happy ending, right? And make it as though they could prosecute um, the suspects, but in the real world, they couldn't even prosecute the perpetrator. Some of you might know Luke and Laura, General Hospital. Um, very similar to the Pepe story. They're the most famous soap opera couple ever. What you might not know is when Luke was originally introduced to the series, he raped Laura. And um, he was a really popular character, so ABC didn't want to abandon him, and so they made a love plot line out of it. For years, ABC denied this happened. Um, but then a strange thing prevented that, which is YouTube. Uh, people put the original video up, and you can go watch it. Um, type in Luke Rape Laura. I know it's not something you want to watch, but it's true. And they admitted, yeah, this was a bad choice, but everyone loved Luke, so we just kind of forgot that he was a rapist. This was a way of sort of whitewashing the past, making it seem like, yeah, we made some mistakes, but we don't want to talk about those. Music gets, you know, still creepy, but a little more subtle. Uh, don't You Want Me Baby by the Human League. I was a little disappointed. I've always liked Dance Hall Days by Wang Chung, but I don't even know what this second verse here, take your baby by the hair, pull her close, and there, there, there. 
take your baby by the ears and play upon her darkest fears. I don't even know what the, the yeah, so you get weird stuff. But the 80s movies are perhaps the worst. 16 Candles, um, Anthony Michael Hall's character, there's all sorts of negative stuff going on in this, but one of the more remarkable, totally unnecessary plot points is after he doesn't get the girl he wants, he's given a drunken, passed out girl to have sex with, which he does and she doesn't remember, and everyone just remarks on it and moves on, right? This is very normal. Revenge of the Nerds, um, is, I mean, there's so many levels of awfulness. I'm revisiting the plots there. It's basically nerds make money by engaging in illegal voyeurism, then making uh, pie tins, which are revenge porn. But the weirdest plot device, well, I can't say which is the weirdest, they're all awful. But at the end, we see our hero nerd here gets uh, the attractive cheerleader. Um, even though he had sex with her pretending to be her actual boyfriend while wearing a mask. But then she says the sex was so good, and so they're happy together. I mean, these are really bizarre, frightening messages. And so when you hear people talk about rape culture, this is what they mean, right? This is, our culture has a model of consent and pursuit of romance that's a little off, or at least I hope you think it's off. Um, but... We now entered a period where rape plot lines are very common in movies and in TV. We talk about it more openly than we used to. And so we're not done with Pepe. Uh, in the 1990s, Warner Brothers, I mean, I really got to wonder what Warner Brothers studio, like, do they just have like a pro skunk sexual assault person there? Um, because they invented a new character, Fifi LaFume. Well, it's a girl this time. It's okay, right? No, she, she attacks different animals. In all of them, she just mirrors the exact same thing that happened before. So she's more indiscriminate. But both Fifi and Pepe are still part of the Warner Brothers stable. There used to be a game, a flash game on Warner Brothers' website where Pepe would get to pin down a cat and it was captioned with, the best thing about Pepe, he doesn't take no for an answer. I mean, these are things that we should have known a long time ago were horrific. Yet, there it is, and we show it to kids. We also have an incredible growth of criminal law portrayals on TV, right? Criminal law is pretty much all of TV sometimes, if you want. You can watch a show about rape 24 hours a day. Um, murder, too. But you can also get, you know, these law and order in all its forms, CSI, NCIS. Uh, I, I never really watched Closer, The Wire, Brooklyn Nine. I mean, the, the, crime is everywhere. It is what uh, our TV has become in, in many sense. Uh, over the last few years, there's been a lot of research in mass communication about what effect this has on our attitudes about crime and violence. And uh, some of the remarkable studies have really been about how rape is portrayed. Um, you might know a little bit about rape myths and these notions that we think are historical, but still lurking around, like how somebody dresses might indicate where they consent. Well, our new media has different stories, but they still have very simplistic narratives, right? Law and Order SVU, which in some ways has raised awareness about sexual violence, also has a very particular formula, right? We know from the get-go who is guilty and who is not. Within our 40 minutes, once we remove commercials, we're usually going to see justice done, prosecution, and conviction. If not, we know justice was not done and we can be outraged, right? It's all put there with a nice little bow at the end of 40 minutes, and criminal law doesn't work like that, right? And in fact, very few police detectives are like Olivia Benson. Um, and so these attitudes have actually been studied mostly on college students, because that's where most of our experimental studies are done. Um, and they show that they have uh, still created different myths uh, being adopted. And one of the most incredible studies in this area, which really calls into question of whether or not we've underestimated uh, how uh, big, uh, uh, how much our media matters here, is in this article, uh, which was done a few years ago. They actually did something that researchers almost never do, which is after doing the experimental study with the control and the treatment and everything, they said, well, let's revisit everyone a couple weeks later. And it turns out that the effects of, in this case, they use a Boston legal episode, if you remember that show, with a completely wrong effect about the law. And they found out that believing in it was, uh, belief in it was much stronger two weeks later than it was right afterwards. Well, that sounds counterintuitive. Why would the effect linger and be stronger over time? The primary reason, we think, is source dissociation. In other words, you don't remember where you heard it, right? You picked something up from a fictional TV show that was totally wrong, and now you can't remember that's where you heard it, so you just assume authority. And so a lot of our media studies in this area, we might be underestimating the effect which people pick up mythic ideas and beliefs that are completely false. 
There's also something uh, uh, lurking in the background here, the, the, the elephant in the room, which is porn. Porn is far more accessible than it has been at any time in our history because of the internet. And research has, has shown now, uh, and you know, a bunch of different studies here, about how porn shapes what we call sexual scripts, which are how people think romantic or intimate encounters unfold. Um, it doesn't mean you're gonna start believing every pizza delivery is like an overture to sex, but it means that certain patterns, certain behaviors are gonna emerge, particularly when it comes to consent, about communication about consent. And so pornography is now, if not the primary, one of uh, the primary means of sex ed in our country. Uh, most uh, um, people encounter porn, and it's more true of boys. So under the age of 17, uh, estimates are between two-thirds and four-fifths of all boys uh, have had exposure to porn in the last year. Most of boys uh, engage in research online for sexual health uh, matters, and they discover porn. In so other words, porn is filling the vacuum that we've created by not educating our kids about sex and not educating about consent. <clears throat> Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm sick today. Sorry. No. <coughs> Even before seeing Kavanaugh. So Kavanaugh, um, just as a footnote here, um, one of the moments that was probably lost in the Kavanaugh hearings to most people, if you weren't just generally, I had trouble watching them, but I, I you know, there it is. He said repeatedly he did not attack Ford and that he was overall, you know, made some errors as a child. But one of the more interesting things, and it's just an anecdote, is that he said, well, he didn't behave the best when he was younger because he was basically, he wanted to be like the guys in Fast, Mon at Ridgemont, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Animal House, and Caddyshack. In other words, he identified some of the 80s movies that had these horrible tropes about uh, consent, about male domination, and said, that's the way I was back then, and he associated more with his drunkenness, but yeah, these shape attitudes. Where do you all think you learned first, and I, particularly I'm talking about younger people here, uh, first, like what it means to engage in a romantic counter, encounter, not, not sexual. Most of the time it's through media and TV, right? We model behavior when there's a lack of information. And so these stories become part of our sexual scripts. There's also a problem of media reporting. How many of you here know what I mean when I say Duke Lacrosse? Okay, how many of you know UVA Rolling Stone? I mean, I don't even have to say anything else, right? You know the whole story on both of those. Now, you all should hopefully remember Anthony Soule from about 30 minutes ago. He was the Cleveland Strangler. How many of you heard of Mari Travis? Mari Travis raped and killed up, possibly up to 20 women, all sex workers or sex worker adjacent uh, in St. Louis, mostly minorities. Um, we don't know the exact number because he hung himself in prison and the police decided we don't need to investigate any further and so that was the end of the case. Now which of these is a greater injustice, right? The Duke Lacrosse was, was bad. It's a story of a very bad prosecutor, Mike Nifong, who lied about what evidence he had and he's been disbarred. It also involved a very unusual complainant Crystal Mangan, the, the woman who reported the case, she's currently in prison for murder. So that's, it's a weird, unusual outlier. UVA Rolling Stone, what was the outcome there? No one was ever named. A fraternity was suspended for a semester. That's it. That's the whole damage. These cases, many people were killed and raped and nothing was done. Those don't get reported, these do. In fact, me, uh, media studies have shown the media is 12 times as likely to report a case of false reporting than a real one, and they are more likely to appear on the front page and elsewhere. <clears throat> so, here's some studies on that. My voice is starting to go. I've been sick, and I'm behind on time. It's a horrible combination. So how do we make sense of panic and denial together? Well, let me give you two other stories here. One, how many of you remember the, the satanic daycare freakout of the, the early 90s? I, it's, it's amazing that I, I, how many people forgotten. We, there was a real thing. People freaked out. Satanic daycare, ritual sexual abuse. Uh, it was all over. There was a lot of focus on the McMartin daycare center. And, uh, you know, Oprah had her own show and everything. At the end of this story, you know, it, it, it was overblown panic. And there was a lot of denial throughout the whole time, but it turns out a lot of Americans didn't, you know, really bought into this. And it was because there was a lot of um, uh, fake uh, mental health experts who were coaching uh, children and, and giving them lies and so forth. Uh, in contrast, uh, you might know more about the Catholic uh, 
uh, uh, uh, church's role in sheltering abusive priests. Um, you know, there's a moment Sinead O'Connor ripped up a picture of the Pope and was basically banned from the U.S. Um, because of this. And her reason for doing it, which was almost never talked about in the media, was because she believed the church was sheltering child sex abuse, um, something that turned out being true. And of course, now we know in a spotlight, this story was true, right? But in both cases, you saw enormous institutional denial and panic. But the difference is that these are not, oppo- or not the difference, these are not oppositional forces. They actually work together. Right? When things are, involve panic, they exaggerate. They create falsehood. It makes it easier for institutions to circle the wagons and deny it's a problem. There's also, you know, to use the example of college campuses, there was an anonymous survey done of university presidents a few years ago. Admittedly, only 32% thinking sexual violence is a big problem at universities. This is not a good <laughs> measurement. I, I think that's that people underestimate the problem. But importantly, only 6% of uh, uh, university presidents thought it was a problem at their campus, right? It's always someone else's problem, right? So panic can be deflected, right, to a more general atmosphere, uh, coupled with denial in the local uh, venue. So I am so over time, it's not even funny. So I'm going to try and finish up uh, here uh, with uh, one other big point. And so I won't get to any of my hope for the future. Uh, It's just going to be all doom and gloom. Um, But one of the really dangerous dynamics about um, uh, movements and activism regarding uh, sexual violence is recently exhibited with Me Too and Time's Up is how much backlash there is and how immediate and prominent it is. Uh, And I think this is truer than any other uh, modern social movement. You might look here at the dates, right? So Alyssa Milano's tweet here is sort of a, a foundational moment, even though she didn't coin the term. It was actually from 2006. Um, but this was the tweet that started the modern Me Too uh, movement, October 15, 2017. By January 12, 2018, of course it was Andrew Sullivan. Andrew Sullivan says it's already gone too far, right? We didn't even get three months before we already had people saying it's excessive. It's, This is, um, uh, has been true of every uh, uh, movement in feminism and gender relations since the 70s. And um, yeah, I don't really have too much time to tell you why I think that is, and I apologize for that. Um, But uh, I think this is something that's important, right? And how our culture here is constantly um, coming up with ways uh, to excuse uh, perpetrators and deny uh, that crimes have occurred, while at the same time keeping the steady panic of laws on sex offenders that are counterproductive, that academic research by people like J.J. Prescott has shown these laws do not work and, in fact, might actually increase recidivism. Um, We continue to do this in a counterproductive way, and it's because we just don't talk about this stuff. We're not willing to honestly engage in a little soul-searching collectively as a nation to realize that our culture regarding sex and regarding sexual violence is messed up. And until we come to terms with that, we can't really move forward. So I'm gonna stop for there, and I wanna give time for questions and answers, but maybe I'll I'll touch on some things if questions uh, lead us there, so thank you. 